Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owitari Dorgan, and with me is... As always, I am the Adam Glass, and this week we are talking about uh, one of our favorite movies. I think both of us very much oh, like this Oh, yes movie. it is. Um, the uh, 1981 <laughs> British children's fantasy film. Uh, really? Children's fantasy film? Well... I don't kind know of, about that. You know, it's, it's, it is no, and this it is, isn't. This is from an era, and we, we can maybe get into this later, but this is from an era where, where children's movies had a dark tint to them. Yeah, that's true. This is, you know, this is Time Man. It's Terry Gilliam's uh, third film after Holy... Well, his third directorial film after Holy Grail and Jabberwocky. Um, and it's, uh, you know, but it's from an era that spawned, you know, I've... What's it? Why can't I remember with uh, with David Bowie? Um, Dark Crystal? No, it's no, not Dark Crystal. No, Dark um, Crystal's the other Jim Henson one that wasn't nearly as good. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> like, I know what you're talking yeah. about. I can't remember either. Yeah, yeah. David. We have Codpiece. Just you, <laughs> David Bowie's Codpiece, starring David Bowie. Just Codpiece. look up Codpiece on Google. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you'll get it. <laughs> Labyrinth. Like Labyrinth is the movie. Labyrinth. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that he can. Yeah. Why couldn't we remember? Now I'm Labyrinth. embarrassed. I said Dark Crystal. I'm, I'm embarrassed that neither of us could remember what Labyrinth was called uh, until I googled <laughs> David Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie's Godpiece. <laughs> I did not say Godpiece. I didn't just get pictures, but uh, but yeah, uh, Jennifer Conley. And then Adam's out of commission for like the next twenty minutes of the podcast, just looking at pictures <laughs> oh, of Godpieces. David Bowie. Uh, oh, anyway, Godpieces. Um, so. So we got a few more Gilliam in this in this collection too. Uh so that'll be fun. Uh he's Oh, is Labyrinth in here? Uh, Labyrinth I don't believe is in here, and that's not a Terry Gilliam film, so I know, but I just thought Yeah. I don't think Labyrinth is, is up there. Actually speaking speaking of that, because uh it, it came up in discussions about Labyrinth. Um uh this movie uh was recently Dan Harmon, the creator of Community, uh Channel one oh one and a bunch of other things, uh but most famously for Community, probably the NBC sitcom that he was recently fired from, or at least failed to be rehired to. Um, but uh, he has a podcast called Harmon Town, which is basically, I think it's once a month or so, he uh, he has a live show where he just goes and talks. And um, it's gotten very popular as he's become more popular, his works have. Um, but on Harmon Town... Uh, I think he was talking about how much his girlfriend uh, likes Labyrinth, um, but he was he was talking about the movies, the movies he likes um, that as as a movie writer he knows he shouldn't like, and one that was mentioned was uh, Hudson Hawk, which is a movie Pat and I which both love. Maybe we've talked about yeah, on the podcast we, before. We, we've mentioned before, I'm sure that Pat and I are the only people on the planet who like. Like uh, Hudson Hawk, but apparently Dan Harmon is also one of them. Um, and I don't see anything wrong yeah. with that. And then, uh, and then he also mentioned this uh, Time Bandits, uh, which he says uh, is a movie um, where there are men where not liking Time Bandits is a deal breaker. That it doesn't matter how hot the woman is, if she doesn't like Time Bandits, she's just out. And that is that is kind of a reaction. I don't know anyone who hates Time Bandits. But there's certainly, it's either really love Time Bandits or completely indifferent to Time Bandits. Yeah, totally, yeah, ambivalent towards it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I've met quite a few people who feel that way about it. Yeah. Or have just never even heard of it. Yeah. So, uh, with that introduction, here's our theme song. The song's over. Let's move on. Oh, um, oh. So by the way, I, I was gonna say something about this. Oh, and now it's gone. Never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm having a lot of trouble thinking. I was I was gonna say something about this. About what? What like, is this? From your from your in, from the movie. Oh, okay. From your intro time, but I forgot. It's okay. 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 The point is, this is a great movie. It's the best movie ever. <laughs> Yes. Okay. We'll go with that. 
End of podcast. Well, I like. I, there's a lot to love about this movie, but obviously, like like Hudson Hawk, it's written as a kind of cartoony movie. But whereas Hudson Hawk is a live action Looney Tune, just to be a live action Looney Tune, and there's no really internal justification for it. Um, this movie is a movie from a child's point of view. Kevin is very much not only the main character, but the point of view character, um, which is another thing that doesn't happen in kids' movies a lot. Not only the darkness of this movie, but but that sort of uh, all-out kids' logic. Just being movie, children, being yeah. Children. Like... And, and in that regard, um, this movie, you know, it's not a... The philosophy of this movie is very, very a children's philosophy, um, and... The, there's a lot of times in this movie where the point of view, the camera is set at Kevin's level, where we're seeing yeah. things. Yeah. We're seeing things as a child would see them, uh, physically, not just, you know, cognitively. Well, and, and we, and we, yeah, we're, and yeah, like you said, we're definitely, we are grokking things as a child, or you could say. Like, I mean, yeah. we, like, just, and almost more than that, like, the film is sort of a child's fantasy. Yeah. Like, the evil guy is evil because evil guys are evil. Yeah. And, and, and in that regard, because this is a children's fantasy written for children, to children, uh, I don't agree with Dan Harmon that it is a poorly written movie. Hudson Hawk is a poorly done movie. <laughs> it is clearly a bad movie, but I love it. No, it's not a bad it, it... Yeah, we're not, not let's about not Hudson justify Hawk. Hudson Hawk. I I will. We both love Hudson today. Hawk, and we could we could go for hours justifying Hudson Hawk. We could talk more about why Hudson Hawk is good than Hudson Hawk could talk about why Hudson Hawk is good. The That's mo- true. The movie itself is not nearly as it couldn't justify itself nearly as well as we can justify it. But right. Um, but I I disagree with Dan Harmon as this being a movie that is. You shouldn't be ashamed to like yeah. this movie because it is a children's movie that is yeah. good at being a children's movie. I, yeah, it's, it's like saying, you know, I feel bad yeah. because I like yeah. Disney movies. Yeah. Well, no, they're children's it's, movies it's, meant for children. This is this is doing what it what it tries to do. And in that in that respect, I think in achieving its goals, it is a well-written movie because it wants to do it does what it wants to do. And yeah, there's, you know, the Maybe some plot holes, but it doesn't matter. It's a movie about time travel and jumping through history. <laughs> and nonsensical time yeah, travel, more and, importantly. And, it's madness. And a bunch of dwarves who were in charge of making leaves until God demoted them and they stole a, they stole a map to, to, steal, to go through time and steal right, treasure. Right, exactly. It's, we're dealing with madness, saying yeah. that, like... This is poorly written madness. Yeah, it's not. Because it doesn't yeah. all line up. Is like saying, well, no, I mean. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, we kind of even get kind of the, the movie kind of even pokes fun at that a little bit. Yeah. Because the evil guy blows up how many assistants yes. for questioning why he can't escape his yeah. own prison if he created himself yeah. and all these things. And it's like, no, that's the whole point is like in a children's fantasy the plot holes don't have to have, yeah, don't have to be filled. Yeah, the, it's not relevant. Yeah, and if Hudson Hawk were marketed as a children's film, it would first it would need right. to make Just some take changes. Out that one to rape joke. Plot. <laughs> yeah. There's that rape joke, uh, among some other things. But but you know, then the the ending where it says, "Yeah, that's probably what happened," would be completely justifiable. And and in that in that here, um, the ending is still it's you know, everybody. Uh, Kevin asks God why there's evil, and God says, I don't know, free will or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, or why evil has uh, to yeah. exist. And he's, yeah, something about free will, I think is what he says. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's, yeah. yeah, I forget the exact name. But, yeah. but literally, that's, you know, he doesn't just say something about free will, he quote something about yeah, free will. Yeah, something about free will. <laughs> Yeah, is God's flippant response to why there's evil, and then he cleans up all the problems and goes home. Um, right, which, which, which in of itself is so a child conceptualization of the universe. Yeah, exactly. Like, which actually, when you think about it, makes the writing amazing. Yes, because not it, bad. It, to yeah. be that childlike as an adult writing a movie is yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah, and it's you and I couldn't do that. No, we couldn't write something that childish no 
No. We would become self-critical. Yeah, exactly. We would make it unnecessarily complicated, and that's what happens with most child uh, children's movies. That's why yeah. you get these children's movies, like you know, I've, I, which I've been watching a lot of lately. Let me tell you, I'm becoming an expert. <laughs> yes. Um, like you get those ones that adults enjoy, and they say, "Oh, it was great. It was a movie that adults enjoy." Yeah. Like it was a child's movie that had something for adults. But I would say that a child's movie that has something for adults is actually lazy child movie writing. Yeah. Because you weren't able to just produce pure child. Yeah. That's you had to be an adult. I wrote this writing a child's I wrote movie. this up on the website a while back, but you know, there's there's a few different ways of doing a child's movie today. And, and everybody, there's generally how companies do them. Uh, like DreamWorks does children's movies and they incorporate adult stuff by having subtle adult jokes. Right. Whereas Pixar just makes good movies that teach lessons and they have adult situations, yes, but they're not... Well, I would definitely say that Pixar does a better job yeah. of this than DreamWorks does. Yeah, exactly. Like, DreamWorks movies are borderline more for adults than they are for children. Yeah. Yeah. Pixar movies are pretty good about just being, okay, here's a Aesop's fable sort of situation. They're family films, but you know, they're not, but they are, they are over the head. Like, I mean, my son has taken up watching toy story. He loves toy story. Yeah. But a majority of things that happens in toy story is beyond his comprehension. Oh yeah. But it's not beyond his enjoyment. No, it is. And that's an important, yeah. yeah. It is a movie but what I'm that, saying is, is that like Time Bandits, if you showed it to an eight year old, there's no flaw. Yeah, they'd enjoy it and they'd understand it completely. No, they, I think yeah, you're absolutely they would, right. it's it, the, both the story and the 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 things that happen in the film. Yeah, are on their level. Yeah, no, I understand where you're going. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So yeah, great. I mean, and there's some jokes like you know God say like eh, I don't know free will and stuff. Yeah, yeah, but but, but like, you know, I mean, but at the same time, not... that's that's the sort of answer, or at least you know, it wouldn't be it'd be a little more ornate than that. It wouldn't be so flippant, but that's the sort of answer a kid would get from their Sunday school teacher. That's, exactly, it's yeah. the sort of answer you would get from a crappy Sunday a Saturday morning <laughs> cartoon show. Yeah, or something about about like why there's evil in this cartoon world. Yeah, uh, free will. There has to be. Um, <laughs> There's evil because it is. Evil is evil. You know. But then again, that's one of the weird things about this film is that, like, the kid watching the movie would never ask that question. Yeah. Because... He doesn't need to. He doesn't... The, the, the evil guy's just evil. Yeah. Evil genius. It's his name. Of course he's evil. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. have you seen the hat he wears? Yes. <laughs> um, There's never been a more evil guy on Earth, ever. Yeah. You know, and and beyond that, we do get a little bit of an adult lesson in this movie, too, because it's also a very anti-consumerism movie. You know, Kevin's Kevin's parents are, are uh, so intent on having the best things, and all they do is watch TV and lust after products and money. And Kevin, Kevin himself just wants to learn things and experience history. He wants to have knowledge. Where, and he's good because he wants to have knowledge. Where all of the adults in the movie, except Agamemnon, just want riches. They want stuff. And even even but, the evil, yeah, even the uh, evil yeah. genius. The evil genius wants technology. He said, like he says, if he had created the universe, lasers would have been eight o'clock day one. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Whereas and God you, is wasting his time do, on forty types of yeah. parrots. <laughs> like you do get. There are various adult elements in this yeah. film like that. It, I mean, it's not completely devoid of those elements because yeah. you do get like, you know, I mean, there is commentary in here. Yeah. But that's not really, in my mind, the main gist of the movie. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you know, in, in the same way, we have those subtle little things about, you know, with, uh, with was it Terry Jones, I think, and uh, Shelley Duvall. The, the, <laughs> the two that keep showing yeah. up in different different parts of time as a couple, you know, they have they have subtle, you know, innuendo conversations, which, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it happens. But, you know, they're, yeah, funny, I mean, they're funny characters, nonetheless. And the way they form it is still funny. 
It's not. It's well, not it's, necessarily even if you're a child who doesn't not. understand anything, yeah. it's funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's 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 mostly funny because Shelley Duvall is playing a python playing a woman. Basically, is her female character there? You know, right. it, it, she's she's playing that woman in as much of an act as if John Cleese were playing that woman. <laughs> it's, it's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> So, so yeah, this movie, this movie is sort of what's referred to as Gilliam's Dreamer trilogy, and this is childhood, and Brazil is adulthood in the adventures of Baron Munchausen is old age, and I think we will be watching both. I know we're watching Brazil. I think Munchausen is on there too, but I'm not. Oh, I'm not I wasn't aware that possible. that one was on there. But, but we will be watching Brazil, and I hope that doesn't depress you, because no, watching it doesn't. Brazil might. <laughs> uh, you know, I've never seen Brazil, so. It's I'm an inter- kind of looking forward. It's a very to interesting it. movie, and you, I, I look forward to to talking. About I have watching it again. I've been I have seen Brazil so many times around, but I've never wa- sat down yeah. and watched it. So I'm actually fairly excited for it. Yeah, but so yeah, and, and yeah, there's a lot. Like I said, the cinematography makes this. The fact that the other main characters are dwarves, uh, it makes it so that yeah, they're adults, but they're still people that Kevin can well, stand with. Well, and yeah, we get into the thing that they're. As childish or more childish. Yeah, they're as childish, and, and he's he's an adult. Um, so Kevin Kevin can can stand above them and be looked up to by them, you know, physically and and literally. Yeah, and we and, yeah, and he is morally superior to them, and it's yeah. just, and he's also more he, knowledgeable than them, and they use yeah. that, you know, because he knows he knows where they are whenever they show up. He figures it out, but uh, yeah. And, really, and, but that's the kind of thing that makes it a wonderful kids movie because we yeah. see this child being yeah. smart, being yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, there's there's a lot of movies where adults are useless, and and you know, it gets a, it's gets annoying to a point. You know, watching. Well, but we don't get a lot of adults are useless in this because yeah, a we get out of the situation where he's at his parents' house very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. We only use that as a very simple framework to say yeah. his parents not great. Yeah. Um and then after that we get to the dwarves and the dwarves are not played as adults. No, they're not. They're not. They're not played as children. They're more played as sort of that kind of entity that exists outside of age that's yeah. unaware of what the world is. Yeah. Like he they they and it's explained in the film. I mean they yeah. We're working making leaves. Uh, the, the, the the events of history are not really super relevant to them. No, they're not until they just until they decide to rob it. Exactly, and you know Napoleon's an idiot, but that's funny. And Napoleon's played for fun, and Robin Hood's silly, but he's Robin but, uh, Hood played by John. Which, by Cleese, the way, is supposed to be silly, right? And but it's not adults are useless. I mean, Robin Hood in this is not useless. Yeah. Funny, but not useless. I mean, he's doing exactly what Robin Hood does. Yes. Plus a plus a punch in the face. <laughs> well, that's that's Robin Hood's we, Merry Men. It's a very a very hilarious. funny interpretation of the Merry Men. I love it. That they're not oh. really they're not really even interested in what Robin Hood's doing. <laughs> they're surprised that anyone <laughs> wants to meet the boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's but I love I love when they dis when when the dwarves leave, and he goes. What unpleasant people, or something like that, yes, yes. under his breath. It's so funny, and but yeah. I mean, we're not. Yeah, I mean, the his behavior and those jokes are totally yeah, acceptable yeah. for a child. I mean, they can yeah. deal with that. And then, yeah, Napoleon's an idiot, but Napoleon's not again not useless. Just yeah. a stupid character. Yeah. Well, that's and so, well, that's what I mean. You know, most of the adults are stupid. And Kevin's super smart, and that would that would annoy me in a lot of other movies. But in a lot of right, other movies, yeah. it's it's a band of kids breaking together because the adults don't don't understand what's going on. But then we get to Agamemnon, and Agamemnon, and and the Supreme Being certainly um, both undo that because God God here the Supreme Being isn't you know he's not Agamemnon's the father character, um, and and the Supreme Being fixes everything. Yes, but he's not. You know, and he has his reasons for having done everything, and we don't necessarily want to understand those reasons because they're silly. It's free will or something. But but Agamemnon is certainly a strong father character for Kevin, and he's a strong adult character. And uh, as a really quick side note, in the original script treatment for this, uh, 
Gillum wrote when describing Agamemnon, some Sean Connery type that we can actually afford. (laughs) (laughs) And then Sean Connery read the script and decided to do it, and that's wonderful. Yeah, and no, he's great. Yeah, and he's great in it, and his character his character undoes any sort of adults right. are terrible. Right, we don't see that adults are terrible. We yeah. see that the adults Kevin has yeah. run into. Yeah, and then he meets terrible. ones that aren't terrible, and that's right. wonderful for him, and it's it's his dream come true, and then he's mad when the dwarves take him away from it. Right. Um yeah. And and then and again we get into a thing that's perfectly geared for a child to understand. Yeah. Ke- yeah. You know, Kevin is happy, and then the dwarves drag him away. He's unhappy. These are, yeah. And it's, I think it's a great kids movie. John maybe will watch one it of when the, he's eight. Yeah, one maybe one of the problems people have with the writing is the ending. And I think if we look at the ending from a kids' logic point of view, it's a lot better of an ending. So you know, we get back, and his parents still obsessed with stuff, blow themselves up, touching a piece of evil. That's in the microwave that caused a fire. You right. know, he woke he woke up as if you know he as if this were all a dream. But then he walks outside and he escapes the fire, and his parents blow up, and oh dear, they've blown up. And he's sad about that because they're gone. And then the fireman is there and looks like Agamemnon and winks at him and drives away. So Kevin's just left alone, and that's very depressing of an ending. For an adult. For an adult. But what happens, what happens then, is that seeing seeing Sean Connery, seeing Agamemnon, or the fireman that looks like Agamemnon, reminds him, and he checks, and he still has the pictures. And he still has the picture of the map, which we've already established can be used just to as the map. anywhere, yeah. Yeah, so he can get back to where he wants to be. He, he can, can get, get back, back to Agamemnon. To Sean Connery, yeah. He can get back to Agamemnon. And he knows how, and he knows that he can. And we don't see that in the movie. That is something that will happen after the movie. But that's that's that last bit of hope that I think a child watching that movie understands. But an adult watching that movie thinks it's kind of a dumb ending. Well, and even if the child doesn't understand, <laughs> like depending on the age of the child and their yeah. capabilities, even if they don't understand the whole photo logic, yeah. he saw Agamemnon. Yeah. Which means it's all okay. Yeah. He's, He's got alone, the hope. Yeah, but that's not super relevant to a child. Yeah. Like, seeing... Because we know that because he saw Agamemnon, it's all going to work out. Yeah. As a child. Yeah. And and a more a slightly more advanced child will see the photographs and know that he can get where he yeah. needs to go. So it's all going to work out. It's really only adults who go, Ooh, huh? Yeah. But now he's just alone. Yeah, yeah, but he's not alone. Yeah. And it's... It's... <laughs> Some people call it bittersweet, and and I don't think it's bittersweet. I think it's just sweet. Uh, yeah, his parents died, but he didn't like his parents. And he already, he already told Agamemnon he wouldn't care if they died. And a lot of people say that sort of thing, and then it actually happens, and you actually feel sad. But they yeah, really but, are just I mean, bad parents. Well, and they're not per- really participatory. Per- yeah. blah, 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 the only time they interact with him, they're yelling at him to go to bed. Or shut right. and stop making noise in his bedroom. And, and, and again, we are talking about a very childish conceptualization of parents, right? I yeah. mean, like, yeah. they are the child understanding of what a parent, a yeah. bad parent is. Which is, which is the, only, the only time where I, where I feel like maybe I'm justifying his actions too much are because if he's viewing his bad parents, then it's an unreliable narrator sort of thing. Well, and, you know, but there's we're, no possible we're way they're as bad as they are. We're talking about an unreliable an unreliable story. I mean, yeah. it's madness. Yeah. The whole story is madness. Yeah, the whole story is so, a fable. So, you know, it can they can literally be just the worst the, parents on Earth. They right. Can be I mean, the evil stepmother. guy is certainly 100% evil. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, we're in a we're in a childish movie, and that produces a universe of absolutes. Yeah, exactly. Because so, get, feeding your child a bunch of shades of gray in a movie is just going to confuse them. Yeah, yeah. And make things not work. Yeah. So, so this is this is a movie with absolutes, and you know, right? His parents are absolutely atrocious parents, and Agamemnon yeah. is an absolutely wonderful father. Yeah, he's a perfect, perfect person. Uh, even though we have subtle, subtle nods to uh, to Agamemnon's true nature, in that his wife's uh, the only interaction he has with his wife is her glaring at him. <laughs> I yeah, love that I love that. 
Uh, but anyway, um, but no, he's still he's still great as far as Kevin's concerned, and, and you know, that's all that's important. That's all that's important. He wants to get back there. He's a great dad. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's weird how we struggle to talk about movies we really like. Yeah, I right. Like we, yeah, yeah. like it's, it's twenty five minutes in, and and we could be done, and I'm just smiling and and fine with it. But, yeah, well, because like it's it's a weird radiance yeah. that comes off of these films we enjoy, where it's yeah, we, there's like, nothing to complain about. There's nothing to yeah. complain about. Um, yeah, like I guess I mean we we this is probably why our podcast needs more structure, uh, where <laughs> yes. we actually like talk about certain elements, the exact same types of elements about each film. Yeah, we we talked yeah. about that a long time ago, and we didn't do it. Um, but like I mean, you could talk about the special effects. Um, for their time, pretty good, I would say. Like, I mean, it's it works out quite well. I I like the the dwarves barge. Like, I like the scene the first night when he goes to bed. I love that yes. scene. That's a great. He goes to bed and then and then the the. No, actually, I really if we want to start this, I really like the very beginning of the movie where we start with a with the map as if it's just a map of the universe because that's what it is. But as if right. we're watching the universe and then we zoom, zoom in on Earth. And then we zoom in on his suburb, and then it's him and his family in the living room. And we reverse that at the end of the movie. That's uh, very bookend, book, uh, bookendish. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have him, you know, looking at his parents are dead, but he's looking at the pictures. And we zoom out, and uh, you know, we've got the, we've got the, the suburb with his house burning, and <laughs> are still smoldering, and you know, out back to the map and Earth and blah blah blah. You know, so we uh, we we start the story zooming in, we finish the story zooming out. It's, uh, it, I don't know. I like it. I like parallelism like that. <laughs> no, me too. And and frankly, like, yeah, this movie is pretty solid about the its visuals, which is a little bit surprising in and of itself, because Terry Gilliam, prior to this, was not involved in things that would be considered super. Visually stunning, right? But yeah. th- this is. I mean, it's not, like, amazing. But, I mean, it's good. I mean, it, it's not... You know, it's just good. It's well done, visually. Yeah. 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 It's, it, Gilliam, Gilliam has had some movies I haven't liked. You know, but, but overall, overall, he's, he's done a lot of good. Um... The Brothers Grimm, for instance, wasn't that great a movie. Yeah, I've never seen it. Uh, you don't really need to. It's just... Well, that was one of those ones that came out after I came to Japan, I'm pretty sure. And yeah. just he got made, skipped. With, with Time Bandits, he made a very perfect fairy tale movie. And The Brothers Grimm was not nearly as great <laughs> yeah, as a perfect. fairy tale movie. Yeah, not, not perfect at all. Though his most recent, uh, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus... Uh, is amazing. Yeah, uh, I saw the advertisements yeah. for that, but it, that never got released here in yeah, theaters. That's the so movie. That's released. the movie Heath Ledger was making when he died, and he died in production. And they worked his death into the production uh, because uh, three actors then uh, Johnny Depp and uh, who else? I can't even remember who else now. <laughs> but uh, they worked. He enters sort of this dream realm and is changed to look like what the person dreaming wants him to look like. So he changes into one of the actors. But whatever happened in that dream realm really happened. So when he comes back to the real world, he looks like the other actor still. That's so interesting. It actually, it, it, it's really interesting. It works out really well. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> I don't really want to focus on all this other work. But this is definitely well, this is definitely one of my favorite and one of the best done of Gilliam's films, I think. Um I'd say Brazil's probably his his absolute masterwork, and Parnassus is is up there, but this is right up there too. Holy Grail is a funny movie, but it's not. Well, like, that's what I'm it's saying. Not like some a masterpiece. Of those, uh, yeah, those those early ones, yeah, w- that involve Monty Python are funny. Yeah, yeah, but they're not they're not visual pieces. Yeah. We like it because we like who's making it, and we and we like the jokes. It's a funny. Movie. We like the jokes. But it's Whereas not... this one, I would say I like the jokes and I like yeah. The visuals. I think this is. I think this is the first time he really hit his stride. 
And you know, it's only his third movie, so it's not really that. Well, yeah, okay, that's true. But yeah. But, well, but, I, yeah. it was. Oh, I remember kind of what I was going to mention about this, though. I was I was watching it right in much of the same situation. I watch a lot of these movies sitting on my laptop while yeah. the rest of my family does things, right? Uh-huh. And um, I uh, <laughs> I got what part was it? I got to um, I can't remember what the joke. Oh, it was the it was the Robin Hood, and when uh-huh. when uh, when uh, I can't remember his name, the actor's name. But John Rob, Cleese, yeah, John Robin Cleese, Hood? yes, yeah, Rhett says like, oh, they're not very nice, or, or something like that, or like, yeah, what a, oh, what, what a bunch of terrible people. Uh, I just laughed, and yes. m- I got the weirdest looks for it. But and, <laughs> and I realized at that point it was like it's been enough time since I watched this movie the first time, like the first eight times or whatever. That, yeah, like I forgot how funny it is. It's actually still funny. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's not funny. just a kids movie, but it's actually funny, and the, and a lot of the jokes are s- funny in that simple childish way. That like, I can imagine that like me and my son will enjoy this when he's yeah. like about eight yeah. years old or something like that. And then yeah, just the dude punching the. <laughs> uh, uh, it makes no, me I laugh love... even now thinking about it. Like, here you go, congratulations. Like Robin Hood, the answer the thing is like, they just wham. The punch across the face. It just makes me laugh so hard. Yeah. Even thinking oh, I about love, it. I love everything. I mean, I love John Cleese, but I love everything about that scene. You know, just the fact that the Merry Men are, are just really violent, just dirty people. Yeah, they're just, and then they're he's, just But he's still the classic green... Right, uh, and he's so out of place. It's so great. So out of place. And then and then what he said, when he, when he talks about the poor... <laughs> right, like they're like... Yeah. yeah, it's like can very, you let the poor very in? noble, yeah, very noble poor, and then they hand they just hand them a piece of gold, <laughs> right, right. Oh, it's oh, and it's then punch so... them in the face and send them on, and, and that's that's very necessary to the process, but right? We never like know is that why. necessary? Yes. Oh, it's great. No, it's just everything about it's wonderful, <laughs> and like it's all those jokes, and just like I said, like the with our um, evil. Yeah. Our evil mastermind, or I forget, I forget the character's name. Evil. I think it's just it's evil. It, I mean, it's really it's yeah, literally okay, just, yeah, it's evil. just evil. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, and like, I love when he like blows up the guy, and then he's like, "Oh, that's a very good question." And like goes on, it's like yes. he blew him up for a very good question. It's, yeah, that's great. And then, like, you've got a lot of really nice care, uh, costume design. And I like that yeah. element of oh, it, too. Yeah. Like, it's, it's the, beautiful. Pe- the costumes are great throughout the yeah. film. The lines are great. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking of some of my favorite lines from The Supreme Being, where, like, he, 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 he hires all the dwarves back, but with a 19% K, pay cut, effective, uh, you know, effective to the beginning of time. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and and Randall says thank you, thank you, and and he kind of just shrugs and says, "Well, I am the nice one." <laughs> just, it's so, it's so, I mean, it's such a childish view of of religion, but it's it's an accurately childish view of religion, and, right? That, and yeah. and, it, and it really, it's weird how well it plays yeah. in, especially can, if you imagine like you know the background that Terry Gilliam's coming from and stuff with uh, yeah. With, uh, you know, it, it's so like that kind of experience you have when you're in Sunday school and you're, they're telling you some Bible story and you're like, every so often you have that moment of like, even the good guys are not very good. You know what I mean? That like, as you're, as a child trying to comprehend that sort of stuff. Yeah. Like, why did God let that happen? And that sort of stuff. Like. Yeah. Why is that going on? And he does a really good job of capturing that in the characters of the Supreme Being and Evil. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and and that's one of the lovely things about this movie. It's not deep, but it's not meant to be. Deep. Well, it's purposely I mean, not deep. It's yeah. I mean, is... it's not like shallow. It's not no, but it's it it, it does what it's trying to do. Yeah, and and like we were saying before, it it is so good at being a child's movie, which again is I think hard to do. It's not something you can just do. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. P- write, many writers try and fail to make yeah. a purely childish film. Yeah. And this, this works. And it's purely childish. You know, and it, you know, the only movies we get now that are purely childish are like Farrelly Brother things, where it's meant to be adult comedies, but they're just for childish adults. Right, and that's a different <laughs> experience. Being yeah. being a childish adult is different than being a yeah. being so, an yeah, actual movie, child. Yeah, this isn't, and you know, Pixar, even Pixar, they don't necessarily they make family films, not children's films. And right, really that's what I'm saying. Is, is like this is this is ultimately a children's film. Right, like a parent, a, a an adult film. who goes in can enjoy it. It is enjoyable by adults, obviously, because yeah, you might I, enjoy I still it a enjoy lot. it. But it it is based totally on childlike glee and enjoyment of the world. You know what I mean? Like, and feelings about the world. Like an, an adult who cannot tap into that. And I think that's where you get that ambivalence that we talked about at the beginning. If you yeah. are not in touch and have a- do not have access to that part of your mind you're going to come off going well that was a waste of time yes so exactly and you know i think i think that's yeah that's that's where you run into the problem of showing this movie to other people it's like, oh i love this movie right and then you're if really run it. the risk that they're going to look at you like yeah, really? well, and you that's why so many movie. people. That's why no one really hates this movie, but they're indifferent to it. Right? Because there's nothing, there's nothing to hate about this movie. Right? It's not bad. Yeah, but there's nothing if you don't if you don't get into it with a certain mindset, and it's much easier to get into that mindset if you're a little boy. Yeah, um, and which I wonder when was the first time you watched it? I I'd say probably I. I had to have been very young, under 12, I'd okay. say. Okay. So that's what I'm wondering is I think a lot of it's dependent on when you're first yeah. exposed to it. Like, if you don't have that initial experience, if you watch it as an adult for yeah. the first time, I think it's much harder. Yeah. Oh, no, I think you're certainly right. You're definitely right. And, you know, so so I I want to I want to make sure that I don't just like this movie out of nostalgia, but I don't. Think no, no, I don't think it's yeah. that. I mean, there's a lot of that. movies that that happens with that you go back yeah. and watch. But I think those movies you like out of nostalgia don't hold up when you go watch well, them I as think, an adult. I think as really, as Hudson Hawk. Hawk might be a movie that I only will <laughs> like out of nostalgia, but still. I don't holds think up so. For me. The first time I saw Hudson Hawk, I was fully a teenager. <laughs> well, I, I, I watched it with actually. you the first time, Adam. Yeah, I made you watch. But it what I'm saying time, is, is that like that's beyond that childish glee element. Yeah, and nostalgia. Yeah. No, like, you're right. I laughed like the, the first the... time, and now if I watch yeah. it, I mean, but that's the thing is like the stupid stuff that happens in a movie that you like out of nostalgia is not funny yeah. when you watch it ten years later. Well, yeah, but I find different things to like it. It's more like I'd say the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. See, that's when one I that showed... doesn't hold up for me. Yeah, when I showed you and Andy the Adventures of Buckaroo Onsai, you thought I was an idiot for liking it. Nah, that yeah, that's the re- true. I that's mean, maybe not true. quite that I, bad, I, but that I've, was the reaction. And I've watched it again since then, and yeah. I still don't like it. I don't think you're an idiot. Yeah. I understand why people like it, but yeah. that one definitely fits into the, I think a lot of people yeah. like it because of nostalgia and cult things. Yeah. More than... But I love that movie, and I just, I showed my two roommates that movie just a couple of weeks ago we watched it, and they both you know, absolutely in love with it. Well, and I think that like, happens. There's, and There's fun things about that movie. There are. There's things, and, like, there's yeah. watching uh, John Lithgow be a maniac, which is always enjoyable. Yes. Well, always funny to and see And which John is Lithgow one of the thing, parts of the movie I actually enjoyed. Um, but you know what I mean. Like, I don't think this one fits into that category at all. This is just an enjoyable movie. I am no doubt that if I show it to my son, he will yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Not this now. Is, he's is, two and a half years old. Yeah, he's not going to. He's not going to pay attention long enough to enjoy this. Yeah, movie, I mean, but... this is a bit beyond him right now. But you know, in a, you know, when he's six, seven years old, it's yeah. gonna be great. So, what we're recommending with this podcast is find a child, watch find it with a child, show them this, watch movie. it with them, and you'll probably enjoy it. Because you're a cold-hearted bastard who has forgotten what it is like to be a child. <laughs> to be a child. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's that's what we're in here, right? That's 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 really what we want to. You're you dead viewers. inside. Um, you're dead inside. If you don't like this movie, you're super dead, and and just you know. And it's a deal breaker. We're not getting married. Me and you, yeah. the person who's listening to this who didn't like this movie. We're, we sure aren't getting married, listener. Sorry. Thank goodness <laughs> we don't actually have any. <laughs> oh, well, I think that, uh, that, that might be to the up, end yeah. of us. That about wraps it up. We both love this movie. Um, we, there are people who don't, and that's okay. But I but give, don't hate this movie. But I would also then you're say just give it a second chance. Yeah, give it a second chance. If you chance, don't watch like this movie. this movie because you watched it at some point in your life where maybe yeah. you were in college and you were overly critical of things. Yes. Because you are a college student. That's what college students do. Yeah, Try that's, it I now. Mean, yeah. Yes. I, you know, I hate, I hate saying about a movie that if you didn't like it, you did, just didn't watch it with the right mindset. But I think, but it, well, we talked about th- that with uh, just the last, last movie. And it yeah. and it was a more positive thing rather than a negative thing that people usually yeah. say. I, I I'm giving that movie the benefit of the doubt that I was not able to watch it in the right situation. Yeah. Uh, speaking of wages of fear. Yeah, um, and, and yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say speaking of wages of fear and, and the act of watching it with more people right. because the more people reacting to it, the, the better it's going to be for you. Yeah. Yeah, the greater feel you'll have to the suspense of the movie. And but whereas I, this one. Well, yeah, so we're going to well, just, just keep running feel, each other yeah, over. We'll keep running into that. I feel, uh, you know, if if my reaction is, well, you need to watch it and think about it like a kid, that's not, that makes it, that kind of makes it a bad movie. And at the same time, normally I can I can agree with that response with myself. But right now I'm really arguing against it. And maybe it's just because I love Time Bandits too much. But, you know, it's a childlike movie and you have to understand that. But at the same time, it's... It's a good movie. Well, I don't think you have to be childlike. Like I said, I think you need... I really honestly think the trick is not being... Ranging between 19 years old and 23 years old when you watch this. Yes. Film. yes. Because if you, if you are a, that, that hyper-critical college yeah. student age, you know what I'm talking about? That, like, yeah. I'm really into staying up late and talking about philosophy and the world and I'm super deep. This is not going to fly. You can be like, this yeah. is so shallow. But give it a shot. You're probably not that age anymore, listener. So try again. <laughs> and if you are, because... Kidnap a child. I, I assume that people, make people him who are him. out looking for podcasts about the Criterion Collection mm-hmm. are probably uh, film students uh, oh, who are crap. going to hate us. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know we're what? talking to you, film student. <laughs> Like Whatever. this movie, Whatever. like this movie. Go Give kidnap it a, a child. I'm sure you're there's. I'm sure there's an elementary Just school don't near kid, your house. borrow one. Borrow borrow one. a don't, child. Don't kid. Take that. him back later when you're done. Yes. Don't touch him. Just a word of the warning. <laughs> never, never touch a child. Yeah. Unless the child asked. Wait, no. Um. This is getting weird, Adam. No. <laughs> uh, so that's I, didn't, the, I didn't mean it like that, Pat. This is the end of the episode. Uh, oh, we're going right. to end on pedophilia. <laughs> All right. So join Thank us Thank you next once week. again for listening to Lost in Criterion. Uh, I'll talk over Pat, and uh, we'll just keep doing that through the end of this. It, to justify this, Pat, is it's now like, what, one thirty where Pat is. Yeah. So <laughs> AM. Uh, so he's very tired. And I'm just talkative because I've got caffeine and I'm waking up for the day because it is only 11.30 a.m. on a Saturday where I am. But thank you again for listening to Lost in Criterion. Uh, this has been our episode on Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits. Next week, next time, uh, we'll be talking about... Uh, it's Japanese, so oh, Pat, okay. feel free I'll to jump look. in and correct I, me I here. I haven't looked yet at the list. Seijun, Seijun Suzuki. Uh, uh, okay, uh, yeah, Seijun Suzuki's branded... Okay, well, the title is just branded to kill. I know that I was no, trying to I pronounce his name. I, was, I thought we were going to... I thought it was going to be like an Andre Rublev type of deal. No, Leo, no, where no, I'm no, like, no, oh, no. I don't know what the name of it is. Oh, oh but yeah, so yeah, Seijun Suzuki... Seijun. Seijun Suzuki. I think I did all right. That yeah, time. you actually did. Pretty Branded good. You're Kill. Getting better. Uh, 1967. 1967. Uh, Japanese New Wave, which uh, I am. I have no experience with Japanese New Wave, Me except neither. where it might have influenced uh, later 
Uh, I will tell you, I do not think Japanese New Wave is still going on. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not a thing. Because I have <laughs> watched some Japanese more modern films, and they, I don't think... Well, we'll see. Yeah. So we'll see We'll see how this, this is. Um, there are certainly some crazy Japanese films I've still seen. But anyway, um, we'll get... We'll, We'll watch that next week, and we look forward to having you back. But you're probably not coming back after this episode, so sorry. Thanks for listening, and I'm sorry. Talk to you next time. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.